My experience at Columbia as an undergraduate put me in contact, obviously, with some professors who very much had an activist leaning, even though they, their primary profession was as professor. One of the most dramatic moments in my time as an undergraduate at Columbia came during freshman orientation week when uh, Jim Shenton, who was at that point already a very well-known professor of American history and an amazing lecturer, gave a lecture to the entire entering freshman class. And he gave this lecture that's it's 1966. It sounded like this anti-Vietnam War lecture I'm coming from a conservative Republican family listening to this. Um, it was incredibly powerful, but then of course when he gets to the climax, what you realize is that what you've been hearing him you speak about is he's using the words of Abraham Lincoln speaking out against the Mexican War. And it's like, oh my God, Abraham Lincoln said things like this. I didn't know how it would happen, but I felt like if I want to know what I'm talking about in opposing war or some other activity, I just need to know more history. 1975, a faculty seminar had gotten created on homosexuality. The person who's leading it mentioned to everybody that there was going to be this panel discussion and it would include some of the biggest names in the field like Irving Bieber and Charles Socarides and you know they were known as two of the most homophobic psychiatrists in America. We plan to infiltrate the session, separate you know through the audience and we had a script that each of us had a copy of that was designed to expose and condemn homophobic psychiatrists. It didn't take long for one of those psychiatrists to say something incredibly homophobic, at which point we started getting up and reading our script, and pretty soon the gavel was saying, you know, meeting over, meeting over, and we stopped them. <laughs> My father, he was determined to turn me straight, so he would wake me up uh, in the morning at around 5.30 or 6 before he would go to work and I would have to get up and we would exercise in the yard together, which was kind of how, with a football and jumping over hurdles and, I mean, it was really hopeless. <laughs> when I arrived at Columbia um, and wrote back to him and said that I wanted to uh, go to the counseling service and start seeing a therapist, um, he wrote uh, and said that he knew why. He knew that I was um, uh, homosexual um, or he suspected that I might be and that he thought that I could change that if I wanted to, that he was worried that I would have a bad life if I didn't. We didn't have any money, but he uh, sent me a check every week to pay for uh, therapy. The very first thing I did at Columbia was, um, this was in 74, and a, uh, a Beam had just announced that he was closing down all of the uh, branches of the New York Public Library. In October, when I arrived, there was a, um, a leaflet hand, and he just sort of pasted up everywhere, saying that we we're going to take over on 2 o'clock the next day, we we're going to take over the library and sit in and refuse to let it, because that was the last day it was supposed to close the next day, and we we're going to not going to let it close. So, because I had come to Columbia hoping for, you know, uh, I had read about May uh, 68, and that's what I thought I would find. Um, so I went. And in a way, I did find that because uh, the, the people, there was a huge group of students, that was thrilling. And I, uh, I was propositioned for the first time at that. Um, we, I think we occupied it for months. I, it went on forever. And Allard Lowenstein and Bella Abzug and Comden and Green and Burns, uh, Leonard Bernstein, and Ray Bradbury, we, it, it became a thing. And everybody came and read, because it was a library, they read like Fahrenheit 451 and books. Uh, it was great. I, I loved it. We slept on the floor every night. And then we went to classes and the old people sort of sat in while we were, and we just kept it going. You know, I'm very proud of the play as a kind of a, an event in the history of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I'm, I'm proud of it to the extent that it came along at a time, at a specific time in LGBTQ liberation, when I think people found it of use. It, it certainly seemed possible in, in the grimmer moments 
of the epidemic that this would actually cause the movement to dismantle. Um, and rather than doing that, uh, people took the hold of the meaning of, of the epidemic, of the virus itself, um, and engaged with it in political terms, deconstructed the, the, the language that was immediately building up around it. They m turned a, a health care issue um, into a, a political issue and then expanded the politics of health care into the politics of enfranchisement and democracy. My Columbia education really, that's where it's really paid off. So one of my favorite, most obvious stories of this is um, I had just graduated from seminary. I was relatively new at the church that I serve. My fa favorite aunt uh, and her husband were, were visiting and we like went out and hung out in New York City and it was really late and on a Saturday and I had not written my sermon. And, um, and my uncle, who, is, who can get you know, quite anxious around time and things, was like, you haven't written your sermon? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll go do it. So I like went off and, and, and like wrote my sermon in less than an hour. Came back and I'm like, sermon's done. And he's like, how did you do that? And, and up until that point, he had been kind of teasing me over the amount of money that my Columbia education cost, because he was like, you know, you could have gone to like any community college and gone to the same seminary that you went to and, and like graduated with the same degrees but you know, you spend all that money at that fancy college, what, you know, and what, what did it get you in the end? It's that, you know, that $100,000 education comes in really handy for being able to go and like write a sermon quickly and efficiently and effectively. So Scott Matheny was the Presbyterian Reformed, pretty much like the generic Protestant chaplain here before there was an actual university chaplain. Um, part of the, 68 riots, which I think was relatively ironic that this was that this came out of it. But from what I uh, remember hearing and reading, part of the demands of the 68 riots was that like we would not have a university chaplain or a religious, like as much of an emphasis on religious life, um, which was kind of fascinating because the university chaplain, university chaplains the world over pretty much, but especially at Columbia was like such a subversive. Um, position actually. So the Student Homophile League, they wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the university chaplain at the time. Like he was like, he, I mean, and he was, yeah, he was like really subversive and really, he was the primary like helper to them. And um, so there wasn't a university chaplain after 68, but there were, there was campus ministries, um, which the university didn't sponsor. They provided, I think, like office space for, but um, Scott had to do all of his fundraising through various Presbyterian churches in order to um, to go and serve as our chaplain. And he he was uh, yeah just a wonderful, caring, compassionate guy. Where I think people quickly realized they could trust him, and he was a real um, strong ally for LGBT folks um, during some really some really difficult and painful times. I know like in my own individual life, other people's individual life, community wise, um, he was just a really great um, champion for LGBT students. And like he made sure that we got all the permits we needed for the dances. There were two dances a month at that time. Like the dances were a really big part of LGBT life here.